You're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. Thank you for tuning in. In each episode of In Search of a Song, we try to give you a glimpse inside the soul and psyche of one musical artist. You'll hear our guests talk about the experiences, influences, epiphanies, and collaborations that have shaped their lives and their work. I've always enjoyed chatting with my fellow musicians about the trials and revelations that we all experience as we explore the mysteries of music. It's a fascinating journey, and I'm glad you're joining us. Our guest today is Tony King. The wind blows high and clear From someplace far away Brings it near and we don't have to think about tomorrow again You're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. This week, our executive producer, Rich Reardon, interviews Australian singer-songwriter Tony King. Australian Tony King is a respected composer with a diverse background. During his 25-year career, Tony has composed music for hundreds of hours of television, including dramas, children's programs, animation, documentaries, and feature films. In 2009, Tony King was voted Australian Songwriter of the Year in an unprecedented three categories. Tony's song, Billy's Dream, in particular, has achieved critical acclaim. Tony performs with partner Chris Ralph in a duo called Beautifully Mad. Before we get into the interview, let's hear some of Tony's music. Here is Tony King. How many miles can an eagle fly? Measure the joy in a child's eye. And how many prayers in a rosary be? Questions on your knees. How many years to the sun goes cold? The more you learn, the less you know. Imagine
That was Tony King. You're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. We'll be back with more In Search of a Song after this short station break. You're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. This week, our executive producer, Rich Reardon, interviews Australian singer-songwriter Tony King. You're listening to In Search of a Song. My name's Rich Reardon, and I am talking all the way to Australia tonight with uh, Tony King. Thanks for being on the show, Tony. It's my pleasure. Thanks for getting me on the show, Rich. No problem. I always start off the show by asking a basic question, and um, it's, what is your earliest musical memory? Wow, my earliest musical memory was actually in in Aden, which was in southern Yemen, where my father was in the Air Force in the mid-60s, and uh, they used to play bagpipes. And uh, I remember hearing the bagpipes as a four-year-old, thinking it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard, and my parents were horrified that I was going to grow up to be a bagpipe player. Oh my gosh, that's uh, very interesting. But I guess that would be a cool sound for a kid, you know? Yeah, I loved it. And I still, you know, have a kind of uh, closet fetish for bagpipes. Now, you uh, did you grow up in Australia or you said in in Yemen, father moving around? He was, yeah. He was. We grew up uh, basically in the United Kingdom because he was in the Royal Air Force. And so every six months we would move somewhere else and uh, got dragged, you know, to Cyprus where there was a civil war. And he took us to uh, southern Yemen where there was another civil war. And that was kind of basically how my formative years were experience and then in between going back to England, uh, mostly the south of England. What was being played around and after you got past bagpipes, what did, <laughs> uh, what did you like? Well, I, my parents uh, used to listen to a bit of classical music and uh, my dad paid, played a bit of uh, blues harp when he he'd had a few wines. So I kind of, uh, they, they loved music and so there was always music around. Uh, it was pretty disparate. They liked classical guitar as well and uh, uh, one of my earliest memories actually was the Jungle Book. That was one. That was the first piece of music that I ever fell in love with. The soundtrack to the uh, the Walt Disney film of the Jungle Book. Oh, really neat. What was it that drew you to it? Ah, uh, well, I probably didn't know why then, but it was uh, it was they were absolutely fantastic songs, and they used amazing people like Louis Prima. You know, was uh, I think uh, King Louis, and they had these incredible performers. And it was an era, I think, where uh, people were absolutely passionate uh, about songs and the craft of songs and uh, kind of a, one of the golden eras. I mean, they, lot, there's been lots of golden eras, but, uh, yeah, I think I responded to the songs and the strength of them, uh, found them infectious, and, uh, yeah, I think that's what it was. You know, when you started to listen to music on your own, when you started picking your own music, how did you get it and what did you listen to? Okay, well, the, the first, first music when I started uh, buying my own music, I, I can remember it was Tea for the Tillerman, was the first thing I ever bought, Cat Stevens' album. And the second album I bought, which was a very strange segue, was Led Zeppelin Two, And uh, I remember thinking it was so um, almost naughty or you know, a little bit kind of the, the devil's music or something. <laughs> I don't know why. I used to turn it down sort of sl- uh, quite low so my parents didn't hear it and uh, not that they would have cared. <laughs> my parents actually quite liked Led Zeppelin. And, uh, yeah, that was the second thing I, I bought. And I worked my way through uh, uh, a lot of uh, Hendrix and Clapton. I kind of loved the blues and uh, loud blues guitar when I first started. So did you start to take lessons or how did you get involved with playing an instrument of your own? Uh, yeah, I was sent off to lessons, and uh, I didn't get on with the guitar teacher because he was trying to teach me a, a, a very staid, or what I considered to be staid form of guitar playing. And I I wanted to play Mason Williams' classical gas, and he said, "Oh, we'll, we'll get to that later. You know, we'll just sort of work with the, the scales for a while." And uh, and so, and but I wasn't happy with that, so I went home, and I had a, a recording of it, and I, I learned how to play it by ear. And I, I went back and I played it for him and tried to pretend I was reading the music because he, he had the music there. And he said he couldn't believe that I'd done it. And, um, and he said, oh, I don't think there's much that I can teach you. So uh, the, the formal lessons ended then. And then I just started listening to records and 
trying to figure out uh, what, how Hendrix was playing something, and I'd, I'd actually put my finger on the LP to slow it down, you know, if, if the lick was too fast. That's how uh, primitive things were back then. I believe in you. I believe in you. I feel like my heart is melting like ice. Is it something divine or the roll of the dice? Did I dream myself back from the land of the dead? Or did an angel move in and take over my head? You don't have a halo, it's true. But I believe in you. In the best laid plans And I don't believe What I don't understand And I've traveled a world Where the truth isn't spoken And I've shuffled my feet Through the promises broken But there's one thing I know to be true I believe in you shoulder on the edge of a knife with a heart getting colder and there's just one thing gets me through I believe in you I believe in you I believe I started playing the guitar because I lived in a very rough neighborhood full of bullies, and I was quite a weedy little uh, kid, I suppose quite geeky before they were, they were geeks, and uh, I was terrified of them, and so I would hide at a friend's house who was next to the school, and um, we would play guitar together for three hours or four hours every day until the bullies had all gone home, and then I would go back to my place. And uh, so these bullies actually did me a huge favor by uh, uh, enforcing this period where I, I would uh, practice for three years, I think this happened. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good thing, as it turned out. Now, were you just practicing to play, or were you trying to write songs at the time? I uh, wasn't really trying to write songs so much then. then. Then I was just trying to figure out how to play, and the songwriting came later. When did you start thinking maybe you could write a song? Um, I think uh, towards the end of high school, uh, I started to become interested in uh, words and uh, actually I remember there was one particular thing that that caused me to write songs. We had an English teacher who really battled with this uh, quite difficult class and uh, she was trying to teach us uh, Keats and uh, Shakespeare and Wordsworth and we we weren't at all interested as a class and so she brought in Frank Zappa records and we would study the lyrics to Frank Zappa like I'm the Slime and all these uh, uh, really interesting songs and you know, he dealt with sex and drugs and rock and roll, which was much more interesting to engage young people. And then uh, when she won our trust and uh, we uh, loved listening to her, she would then kind of um, uh, teach us the curriculum and, and we wanted to do it for her because she uh, she sort of bonded with us. And 30 years later, uh, that was what made me want to become a songwriter because I just loved the way Frank Zappa explored ideas and the way he put words together I found really uh, uh, engaging and interesting and I saw her 30 years later and I said uh, said to her you're you're the reason you know that I became a songwriter because uh, uh, you brought in Frank Zappa and and some other interesting songwriters and I it made me want to be a songwriter and, and she burst into tears and she said you know I thought no one was listening 
I could have thought no one was listening. And uh, she was inconsolable and uh, had to give her a big hug and say, well, you know, <laughs> you know, I, you know people were. And she had um, laboured under that um, sort of illusion for 30 years. She thought she'd wow. made no difference to anyone. So it was a fantastic uh, moment uh, to be able to uh, thank her for the reason that I became a songwriter. So when you did decide, okay, I can try to start writing, where did that come about and what were you writing about? I was, I was always interested in the world, I suppose. I suppose you'd call it you know, world politics and how we live as a, as a society. And so uh, I, I started writing songs for uh, along those lines and I always wanted to have something to say. And I, and I liked songs that had something to say. So it always started with the lyrics for me and, and then uh, the music would come uh, not less importantly, but it would come afterwards. You know, all songs have always, from a very early age, had to be about something. How does songwriting come to you? Do you write the music first or the songs first? How, or, or, I mean, the lyrics first? How, how does that come about? Uh, yeah, I always, I always 90% of the time, would write the lyrics first and I get an idea for a song just travelling around. Uh, I read a lot. I love films, always listening to people's stories. And if I hear something that I... Uh, I think would make a great idea. That's the beginning of the song for me. I don't tend to write the music first, uh, although I'm trying to do that, but just to kind of, you know, so you don't get stuck in a rut. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I start with an idea and I, I sometimes go, go on a fast of stimulation, a sort of traditional stimulation. If I'm writing, I'll stop watching television and I'll, I'll just read poetry or uh, I'll. Yeah, I'll sort of distance myself from the traditional media because it kind of makes you, makes my thoughts a little bit boxed in. So I, uh, I, I tend to do that. And where we're playing at the moment in Australia is on Heron Island, which is a fantastic place to play music at night time. And during the day we have this silence and reverie, which is perfect for uh, incubating songs. Where were you at this point when you first started writing songs? Uh, were you living in Australia yet? I was living in Canberra when I first started to write, which is kind of like our Washington, D.C. It's the uh, the centre of politics. It's the capital city, but it's not one of the um, the big cities like Melbourne, Sydney. Yeah, we, I was living there when I started writing songs. Did you try to perform them, or, or was it just writing them for yourself? No, we performed them. We were lucky uh, in this, even though it was a little city of a couple of hundred thousand people, there was live music on five nights a week, maybe six nights a week, and bands were playing their own material. So we had a, a completely original band, and uh, I don't think I, I played in a, a covers band um, for the first sort of four or five years that I was uh, uh, playing in uh, bands in Canberra. You're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. Our guest today is singer-songwriter Tony King. Support for In Search of a Song comes from Airtime Recording Studios in Bloomington, Indiana, the Bluebird Nightclub, and visitbloomington.com. We'll be back with more In Search of a Song after this short break. You're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. This week, our executive producer, Rich Reardon, interviews Australian singer-songwriter Tony King. You said you were playing covers. What, what were people expecting to hear at that point? At uh, that point, uh, there, were, there was a big blues scene, uh, but also the new, new wave music was starting to happen, and, and we got caught up in, in that. We liked the police. Uh, we liked the uh, pretenders. We liked talking heads. Uh, we liked XTC, and, and there was, a, I suppose, the English wave of new wave bands were starting to be popular then, and I suppose, and our own music sort of uh, emulated that uh, to a large extent. Did you start to record it at one point? Yes, we did. We uh, I won a song competition in about 1980, and and we were given as a prize. We recorded a demo for I think it was CBS Records back then, and uh, yeah, so we we did get to record, but the band, uh, <laughs> as often the case, broke up uh, as soon as we did the recordings, basically. So uh, that was the end of that. So what happened after that? Were you did you consider you know doing more recording, or did you just continue to play out, or what? Uh, then I moved to Sydney and mm -hmm. uh, um, continued with another original band, but it uh, uh, was very difficult, uh, very hard to keep the band together, and I, I actually ended up becoming a solo performer then, and and I stopped playing uh, rock or pop music altogether and, and started exploring the uh, American uh, folk songbook and just started playing acoustic guitar, which I, I did for years. 
and then started recording albums of uh, that kind of music uh, early on. And uh, so, yeah, I, I didn't actually go back to pop uh, rock bands after that. Can you give me a bit of your timeline between what you're doing now and, and say, the 80s? You say you did a lot of folk music. Um, when did you start getting back into more of a recording situation and getting more serious again? Okay, well, I, I had my own recording studio from about 1992. So for, for maybe uh, 10 years, I uh, dipped in and out of recording where I had to pay for it in other studios. But basically from 92 onwards, I always had my own recording facilities, which was fantastic. So um, sort of steadily put out albums then with uh, my partner, uh, Nina Vox, also known as Chris Ralph, and we would uh, do our own uh, vanity presses, I suppose they're, they're called, when you're independently uh, released. And, uh, uh, yeah, that's basically what happened. I loved having the studio. That was just different. It, was, it changed my life. The look on your face tells a story. Are you wounded and lonely again? Why do you knock when you still have a key? Come inside out of the rain This reminds me of when we were lovers And the tears that used to be mine Now all we have is each other And the salty taste of the wine And you'll love me whenever I need you And I'll love you until you're asleep Sometimes a love that will save you Only needs to be sympathy Souls open for the jack boots of love to walk in. Just to wipe their feet on our secrets, and the next day forget where they've been. Can I come in and play on your piano And we'll sing ourselves back from the dead And I know you'll be gone in the morning With a little more peace in your head Sometimes I think about the future It's as delicate as a thread The strongest thing in the universe Is somebody touching your head 
This is Jason Wilbur, and you're listening to In Search of a Song. So you've been around with uh, Chris Ralph for quite a while. Yes, it's a 30, 30th anniversary, I think, uh, this year. Wow. And uh, for our listeners, Chris is a woman. Chris is a, normally you would think of a man's name, but uh, I see. Also, I was real interested in the, the song that you sent in for the Searchlight Song Competition, uh, which was Billy's Dream, and that's what won and really stood out to me. How did you write that song? What, how did it come about? Okay, well, it was inspired by a reading, uh, my I think my favorite writer, Kurt Vonnegut Jr. He wrote a, a fantastic uh, seminal book about uh, war, a sort of anti-war book called um, Slaughterhouse-Five. And, uh, and there was a character in it called Billy Pilgrim who um, has a dream that um, the, the war is a movie that uh, plays backwards to innocence, and I thought, what a fantastic um, image for a start, and uh, and would make a great song. So, and I wanted to do justice to it, so I um, wrote a song, and um, uh, we were fortunate; it ended up winning the the best uh, song. I think in two thousand and nine, I think it won the best song and best lyrics, and I was was so pleased because I, I really want this song to be heard uh, a lot because uh, war. And the culture of guns um, means an enormous amount to me. Well, I'm going to put the uh, the video up on our blog. I hope people uh, take the time to uh, to take a look at it. It's a really well done video you had made too. We were very lucky. Um, we wanted to do a film clip, and we sent uh, we saw a film clip of Tom Waits of his last album uh, called uh, Hell Broke Loose, and the the person who did that was Matt Mahuren. And uh, it was just an incredible film clip. And then we looked at his other film clips, and he'd done film clips for U2 and Metallica, uh, Peter Gabriel, very disparate but interesting artists. And uh, and we emailed him, and, and he loved the song, Billy's Dream, and wanted to do something that was a plea for peace because it was a, uh, a big issue for him as it was for us. And uh, uh, he agreed to do it for us, and I was so pleased that he did because it's a, it's a tricky thing to to get the film clip right and we didn't give him any notes we just let him interpret it and uh, and I, yeah i hope you enjoy it as much as we did well it's funny um i'm not usually a big fan of videos i never have been i don't like necessarily to do anything more than visualize a song you know kind of in my own mind but this is a little different this is um really well done you know not just in a way of saying yes it's good videography or anything else but the song billy's dream is basically about maybe you can explain it better than me but it kind of goes backwards there's kind of two things happening at the same time and matt's quite clever with it uh the lyric um of the song describes uh war being uh played backwards uh, so all the bullets you know are kind of go back to the guns and bombs are sucked up from the ground back to the plains where they came from and uh, soldiers become innocent children again. And uh, he has um, another story going over the top of that. Of uh, I don't want to give too much away. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, he's interpreted it, um, not, not literally, but he has uh, told exactly the same story and, and told the story of the child's dream. Uh, visually, and it's incredibly clever, I think, the way that he has done it. The war was a movie play backwards At least it was in Billy's dream Bombs were sucked up from their holes in the ground To the plains where they had once been Back to their guns Bleeding wounds healed themselves over And smoke cleared away from the sun And the bombs were sent back to their factories Dismantled with all of the planes And the Auschwitz Stepped off the trains And the soldiers turned back Into children To innocence again To innocence again And the soldiers turned back 
into children to innocence again to innocence again the trenches turn back into fields from Vietnam to El Alamein and the young men rose up clean from the mud to the lovers arms again Sang the hymns back from my men And the medals were melted back into one piece And Enola was gay once again And the soldiers turned back into children To innocence again, to innocence again And the soldiers turn back into children To innocence again, to innocence again And love was returned to the people Free will taken back from the man And the apple Again, and the soldiers turn back into children to innocence again, to innocence again, and the soldiers turn back into children to innocence again, to innocence again, and the soldiers turn back into children to innocence again, to innocence again. Beautifully Mad, is that the name of your band? Yes, it is. Why don't you tell me some more about how that came about? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a celebration of the broken bits and the, the mad bits in all of us, the dis- dysfunctional bits that make us more interesting. And uh, often those bits, it can be literal uh, madness or it can just be a, an anger or uh, something that, that I think makes people... The, the struggle in them makes them who they are and it, it ends up um, doing you a favour in some ways even though you know you wouldn't necessarily agree with that on a daily basis but it, it, it kind of makes you who you are uh, the bits that you struggle against and so Beautifully Mad is, is the beauty in those broken bits You have a song called Beautifully Mad uh, is that basically the story behind the song too? <laughs> yeah, yes it is it's, I mean it does, I don't put it quite like that but, it's, but it is that's exactly what it's about yeah it's about relationships and no relationship is, is uh, perfect uh, although my partner's pretty perfect and, uh, but it's you know it's, yeah it's a celebration of those bits that um, uh, where you both can embrace each other's madness and, uh, and you kind of love them for their madness I've read the Bible and the label on a bottle. I try getting angry and I've tried getting sad. I found a good woman who deserved a lot better. She tried to repair me, now she's beautifully mad. Cause the world is no place for the same. But when you're insane, It isn't so bad It takes away the worst of your pain When you're beautifully mad You're beautifully mad I try to be rich I try being poor Try being peaceful And it ended in war But my mind let me down Was all that I had It's a fine line between crazy 
I'm beautifully mad Like a ship that's into a bottle How to breathe it all that crazy love Inside our hearts Inside our hearts I followed the grass See if it's greener It's life following cows To see what they eat And I won't be told Until Hades is cold From the jaws of victory I will snatch my defeat Cause the world Is no place for the same But when you're insane It isn't so bad Takes away the worst of your pain when you're beautifully mad. You're beautifully mad. Well, the life that I tore along the perforated line, well, that was the life I regretted I had. And the friends I will miss Come the tunnel of light Are the ones Who are beautifully mad Cause the world Is no place for the same But when you're insane It isn't so bad It takes away The worst of your pain When you're beautifully you're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. Our guest today is singer-songwriter Tony King. Support for In Search of a Song comes from Airtime Recording Studios in Bloomington, Indiana, the Bluebird Nightclub, and visitbloomington.com. We'll be back with more In Search of a Song after this short break. You're listening to In Search of a Song. I'm Jason Wilbur. This week, our executive producer, Rich Reardon, interviews Australian singer-songwriter Tony King. So do you collaborate with her at all, or are you basically writing songs by yourself and she's just helping vocally or musically? She writes uh, occasional songs. Uh, I wish she wrote a bit more, but uh, it's not really her thing. But when she does write a song, it's, it's a cracker. And uh, she's written a few songs with me on this, uh, the new album. One of them is called She Kept On Swimming. Uh, which I don't think I sent you yet, but it's it's a beautiful song uh, about the life of a turtle because we, where we live is on Heron Island and we uh, we care very deeply about the ecology and the environment and the turtles, unfortunately, uh, are really struggling uh, worldwide. So we wrote a song that was uh, to show what they would experience in, in their lifespan of you know, 100, 150 years these incredible creatures live and, and we figured they would have been alive before jazz was born you know? and they kind of, they've seen this, been through just two world wars and um, the same turtle swimming around the place so it was kind of a uh, and it has a twist in it as well which I won't give away but it's an environmental twist to, to show people uh, how we have to take care of the place um, but she, yeah, Chris wrote that uh, with me, and uh, but mostly I write by myself, and uh, yeah, it's just the way I always have been. I like to kind of tinker uh, with uh, songs myself. And having said that, she'll come into the studio, and she, I trust her implicitly. She she has the most unerring uh, editing facility, and uh, I can tell just the way she looks at me sometimes that uh, you know I'm barking up the wrong tree. So uh, you know, I go, okay, I guess he didn't like it. She just <laughs> walks away and comes back later on and goes, yeah. That's better. <laughs> so I, I trust her uh, to uh, make sure she's got a great filter. She was born on this island a hundred years ago. Of the thousand turtles hatched that night, she was the only one to survive. She'd dodge the sharks and the fishermen. Cyclones came and went. A plane came down in World War II and put a gash along her shell. Put a gash along her shell and she kept on swimming. Kept on swimming. Kept on swimming. She kept on swimming. Till the safety of the current took her. She struggled up the beach 
On that same day man was weightless On the surface of the moon She was alive when jazz was born And for the birth of rock and roll She was blown out of the water At me were rower at all At me were rower at all There's another song on there that catches my eye, The Tide Will Come In. Uh, since we're on the, the talking about the island and, and the ocean, is uh, that one another environmental? Well, no, it's not, actually. It was, uh, it's, it, that one was inspired by watching a fantastic film made in the north of England uh, about the mining strikes uh, when they were on uh, during Thatcher. And uh, it was inspired by a film called Brassed Off, and it deals with what happens with a small community when the industry goes bust. And uh, it's actually very relevant now in America, you know, where, um, you know, you've got some challenges um, with your car industry and other industries that, you know, really have a hard time surviving. And what happens to those communities? Because, you know, places are all about, you know, cars, like Detroit, you know, for example, or... You know, in the north of England, it was coal, and it was a story about this uh, small coal mining place where um, I won't give it away again. But yeah, it was a, it meant a lot to me because these these uh, these communities disappear when the industry goes, and, and um, so it was a kind of a poignant uh, love story for a father and uh, how he does everything to try and um, do the right thing by his family, but they um, they really struggle against it when uh, the industry starts to die. It was a low tide All the ships on their side No chance of my boat coming in I knew how they felt As the seagulls cried And I did my best not to join in when the coal mine closed, half the town was laid off. The 
ships so lay down and give up The shouting went late With the smashing of plates No way for a kid to grow up But the tide will come in That's what the old man told me And the ship will sail again Sometimes it feels like you're stuck forever Till the tide comes in Taking his lunchbox Off in the morning Past the foundered Ships he would go Bringing back handouts That came from the Union We pretended That we didn't know Looking for sympathy Wasn't his way It was more than a cough In his lung Some money to send me away. Said this is no place for the young. But the tide will come in. That's what the old man told me. And the ship will sail again. Sometimes it feels like you're stuck forever Till the tide comes in Till the tide comes in town turned up on his funeral day as the brass band marched up to their place the tide came in took his ashes away and he went with amazing
you know, I don't want to make yeah. this a show about the, uh, you know, the plate of coal and the and people, but I do think that that it's important to talk about how some musicians really do take it on themselves to write about things that they really care about, of course, and uh, that's where yes. that's where this this song started for you. Absolutely. Well, Joe Hill, he was one of your great songwriters. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how he started, and uh, I was really uh, fascinated by him in the Copper Mines before there were recorded music. He would just go around playing songs and basically trying to get um, the conditions a little better for uh, these copper miners who were dying uh, all the time. And um, I guess that was the beginning of um, the union in America. But, uh, yeah, just the the humble guitar. It's got a a long uh, history for um, uh, trying to help out, I think, and tell the story. And, uh, yeah, I'm interested in that. I think we're digressing from our show here. (laughs) (laughs) That's all right. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you do write about social issues. You do write about political issues sometimes. Um, what do you think makes a good song? I, I think a good song is, is something that gives you goosebumps, that, that uh, changes the way you feel after you've heard it, something that stays with you, uh, maybe changes the way you, you think, or it can just you know, make you feel amazing. Uh, it can be in a... But it, it has to it has to make you feel something. I, I think that's that's what a good song is is for me. I, it's a terribly subjective thing, but, sure. <laughs> but that's what I think. It bonds people, you know. It, and uh, it's it's a way how it's a way of us finding our people. We've kind of um, met a fantastic group of of friends and like minded people through music. Uh, it sparks conversations. Um, sometimes you'll say something that somebody has not been able to put into words themselves and it's been a very healing and cathartic thing for them. And that's happened a lot Mm. with uh, songs that we've written. Uh, There's a beautiful song Chris wrote um, called Let Them Fall uh, about a a cot death and uh, the number of people who have contacted us to say it made such a difference in the healing process of dealing with the the loss of this child. Um, So, yeah, I I think it's... Uh, music has a really important function. Uh, I, I, I'm aware of that when I am writing. I think, oh, I hope this, you know, helps somebody um, who's dealing with pain, or you know, in the same way that it helped me when I was writing it, uh, deal with pain or deal with frustration or something that might be important to you. If it if it helps somebody else to to uh, go through something and process it where they might not have been able to put it into words or or the music sort of unlocks this cathartic process, then um, I couldn't be happier. They're the nicest letters that we ever get or emails, and you think that's why you write music. There's a great Tom Waits line about songwriting, and he said, uh, he says, uh, I hope the music likes me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think a lot of people have expressed it over the years where, you know, they say that, you know, the ideas don't come from songwriters you know we're just the mailman you know just delivering the mail and right. people have said it in lots of ways but um but if that is the case and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot in that where ideas are floating in the ether and and you know our job is to sort of get them down you know the best we can sure then it's you know you don't necessarily have the whole picture in your head but you've you've kind of you've you put it in a way where it will resonate with people mm-hmm. and uh and and that truth will be in there, and it's it's kind of uh, yeah. I think that the songs are open to interpretation, and the interpretation has, has is part of the ether. You know, it's kind of been fed to you, and you might not have known um, the uh, the sort of full breadth of it when you wrote it. Well, I certainly do feel that uh, you've done very well. I enjoyed all your songs, and I hope the folks do too. And uh, please thank Chris. I, she didn't come on today, but. Uh, I definitely appreciate you know what she's been adding to the everything as well, and thanks for yeah. thanks for being on our show. Oh look, it's been my pleasure, Rich, and uh, yeah, I, well, keep in touch, and I'll uh, I'll be a regular uh, listener to your radio show now that I, I know that it's out there. Great. Well, again, thanks so much for being on the show. It's my pleasure. Lovely talking to you. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. I hope you enjoyed listening in on this interview with Tony King. We want to thank Tony for taking the time to make the show possible.
Support for In Search of a Song comes from Airtime Recording Studios in Bloomington, Indiana.